Okay. So uh, good morning, good evening all, and uh, we welcome you to our New Perspectives eight-part series that began last week. It's on savagery, a legend, and a symbol. And this series is dedicated to Sri Aurobindo's 150th birth anniversary. Um, I'm Rade, and Vladimir and I are here at the Lagrasse Center in Fountain Inn, South Carolina. Of course, also with us today is our esteemed speaker, Dr. Alok Pandey. Welcome, yes. Dr. Pandey. Uh, Dr. Pandey will address Savitri as a path of yoga towards manifestation of the highest spiritual realization. Alok states that Savitri is the epic of the human soul in its ascension towards light and freedom and truth and immortality. It is a yoga that is interwoven with life and the challenges of death <clears throat> and fate. It leads us to a fascinating journey towards the supreme consummation of our humanity and to a higher, diviner possibility. Today, a local focus on the yoga of savagery in man's inevitable destiny. Before turning it over to Alok, though, I would like to just mention two of his books on savagery that were recently published, and I've put them in the um, up. I see I only put it in the host, so I'll be putting it in the chat box to everyone um, and how to uh, purchase these books. But one is on the writings of savagery. I don't know if you can uh, see this or not. Um, the writings of savagery. And uh, this is uh, a series of articles and Cantor Wise uh, Reader's Guide and essays on book one. And the other is talks on savagery. If you can see that, <laughs> transcripts of selected talks from 2005 to 2020. So they are available here in the US um, through Sergey. And again, I'll be posting this in the chat uh, uh, shortly, and they are also my understanding, Alok, that they are available at uh, Shabda for those that are in uh, India and uh, Pondicherry. So with that very brief introduction, let me uh, turn it over to you, Alok. Has the recording been started by Vivek? I can just see the red light is on. Okay. <clears throat> Namaste. Uh, I believe that the first session was about the story of Savitri as it's retold in the epic. And we may wonder that uh, how this story, which is uh, belongs to the Vedic cycle, as Shubhinda says, how is it contemporary and relevant? Well, uh, behind all our stories, plenty of stories that happen every day, there is an eternal drama which is going on and that is the story of earth, the story of man, the story of the divine event unfolding upon earth. And Savitri connects us with this deeper story. And the reason why we should connect with this deeper story is that so that our own story, individual story of life can realign itself to the true uh, stream, to the true rhythm, which is running as an undercurrent or an overcurrent, if you like, of life. And by connecting it, we can put the whole uh, thing in perspective, we can, you know, our own journey can be so much more beautiful and aligned to that which is happening upon earth. So Savitri starts by that in the very first canto of book one, we see that the very beginnings of earth, earth has been made for a very special action, the divine event. And that divine event is the great drama, which is unfolding, which is uh, about the divine manifestation. So there is a divine consciousness which is buried in earth, which is hidden in matter. And this divine un uh, consciousness is unfolding through form. This is the important part. This unfolding is taking place with matter as the condition, with form as the means through which this unfolding is taking place. This unfolding means that there is all the divine possibilities, the divine um, uh, energy qualities. They are going to gradually express in their utmost perfection um, upon earth. So the, the whole evolutionary journey of man is about and Savitri reveals to us about this journey. Now this journey has two main um, stages, if you may say so. 
One is when there is a long preparation. So when we see the book of beginnings, there is a long preparation through the darkness. Something is happening, but no one knows. Earth is moving around the space, uh, in space, around the sun. But this preparation is itself a preparation for is itself a beginning of something else which is going to take place. So a long preparation followed by a leap. The leap, as Shabindra puts it, is the hour of God. So when there is a long preparation, the divine is hidden behind and is working through you know, human agencies, through events, through circumstances, through situations which are changing and evolving. But from time to time, when there is a crisis or some new possibility to be directly manifested upon earth, the divine steps out in the front as the avatar, as the leader, as the representative delegate of the eternal and carries the evolution leap uh, through a kind of a leap or jump time. So Savitri captures that moment when this leap is taking place in far back times, when uh, there is uh, a new possibility to be manifested, the possibility of uh, a human being defying fate, defying death and conquering it. So this is the possibility that takes place in far back times. And Shobindo recounts that in the epic sa poem Savitri, now, how is it connected today with what's happening today? Well, this is the original story. So ultimately, it is all about the conquest of the divine upon earth, of light upon darkness, of truth upon falsehood. Or we may say that light transforms darkness, truth transforms falsehood, makes the crooked straight, if we may say so. Bliss transforms its disguise of suffering and pain and pleasure and indifference. So this is a great drama which is unfolding and what was started in far back times by Savitri uh, is that project which has gone through many, many, many stages, centuries, millenniums has arrived at a time when it can enter into a new phase and that is about the collective change. So what we are going to witness today or are witnessing today is that story which was started way back by the divine representatives, Savitri and Satyavan and Ashupati, who are the main protagonists, is now being taken towards its culmination, towards its grand finale. That was scene one. And this is the last scene through many acts, through many pralayas. If we take each cycle of evolution is a pralaya, then we can say that this, uh, this is the seventh act and the fourth scene, which is going on after which the curtain doesn't drop, but the scene shifts further and further. So this is how the story is connected with what's happening today. And Shobindo very beautifully connects it this way that Ashupati, who is the seer in far back times, the divine representative, the eternity's delegate, a colonist from immortality. These are the terms used to describe him who has come to, uh, who uses the human cloak as a disguise of the divine. So the divine comes upon earth to carry it forward. And there is a work that he has to do. And Savitri herself has come, comes down as a response to Ashupati's tapasya, her prayer, his prayer to help humanity move across one step or open the door to a new possibility. So this is the basic background. So now when we come to yoga, so what really is yoga? We understand yoga by something we do. But from the divine standpoint, <laughs> yoga is what the divine does. Indeed, all works are done by the divine. And one of the first things that yoga teaches us when we practice it in real earnest is that nothing really is done by human beings, but we are, we have a role to become a channel, a uh, uh, instrument, big word, but a channel, uh, a bridge between what the divine is doing upon earth and the actual manifestation. So our role is basically to collaborate. The yoga is done by the divine. That's what Savitri reveals to us. And Right in book one, canto two, we are shown that it is Savitri, the divine mother's earlier incarnation, part incarnation, which has come to uh, work upon earth, help it move forward. And um, we as human beings have to collaborate. So then comes the next story. So, but before that, Ashapati's yoga. So we see that these, process, these uh, moments of time when evolution takes place when suddenly we see there is a breakthrough, long preparation in a species through all the challenges and then it breaks into another species. So before that breakthrough, there are several possibilities that begin to emerge. What we today call as link species, which ultimately vanish, but they ultimately prepare for the great leap. 
so when we zoom in on to human consciousness so we see for a long time on one side human beings are stabilizing the mental evolution it's not yet fully stabilized though now it has entered into a hyper accelerated mode but time to time within the human uh, consciousness mentalized consciousness there has been the emergence of a spiritual consciousness so we call them as saints seers uh, often regarded as freaks because during their time nobody understand them they look at life differently they work differently they understand things differently they feel differently they act very differently these are the countless little possibilities like those intermediate species but they have never really been able to help humanity gather enough momentum to cross over and become a new species apart yet they are they are those spiritual experiences of the past they have been like a preparation they have opened up a door somewhere in our inner being somewhere above the mind and shown us some possibility a glimpse here and there now the time has come for all these countless little efforts to come together and to that add something else that mysterious grace that mysterious divine love and ultimately make the great transition from the human to the supramental race so at first we see the first part of the yoga is ashwapati's yoga there are three or four yogas which are revealed here one is the yoga of ashwapati which more than the yoga the actual yoga of ashwapati is really not described here what ashwapati has done to really realize all this all that we are told is ashwapati has prepared himself and he is the chosen one sometime the inexpressible mystery chooses a human vessel for descent so ashwapati is a chosen one and we know it's quite like shurbindo who has been picked up chosen and through that the divine consciousness is working out the miracle of the next stage so ashwapati is a chosen one and all his experiences are what shurbindo's own experiences are as the mother says uh, savitri record of the experiences of the author so i strongly advise that instead of reading records of yoga which can sometimes make us you know go into a tizzy savitri contains the record of the experiences of shurbindo and with what beauty and charm and wonder and grace and rhythm and poetry and majesty and light and consciousness of truth so ashwapati's yoga is essentially a yoga where we are shown all the experiences that mankind has up till now gathered and accumulated so if we look at book 1 canto 3 uh, the yoga of the king the yoga of the souls release from ignorance this is a fundamental yogic experience and we have very elaborate description of what happens when the inner being opens what happens when we have self realization what happens when we rest abode in indivisible time what happens when we are freed from ignorance what happens when we begin to converse behind the veils with the forces the power the energies the gods all that till now whatever we have heard about various spiritual experiences are by and large described in one canto and then in canto 5 a new possibility opens up for ashwapati so that's why we see that uh, shurbindo in pondicherry after having gathered all the experiences and realizations of the past when he comes to pondicherry and suddenly a new possibility comes up and that possibility which has been only he has been glimpsed he has glimpsed it and when he comes here he begins to experience beautifully described in savitri a vast descent leap down so that's where we see a parting of the ways from traditional yoga into a new journey a completely unprecedented adventure and all that ashwapati discovers we can use now shurbindo as one and the same discovers has been described in book 1 canto 4 the secret knowledge so paucity of time we are not going into all its details but we'll just read a little of this new experience which is unique to shurbindo's yoga and um, which is what is uh, the defining moment if i may say so of shirbindo's yoga after which a whole new process begins so this is on page 81 we can uh, you know not imagine we can visualize shirbindo in a divine retreat from mortal thought in a prodigious gesture of soul sight his being towered into pathless heights this is a path which has never been known naked of its vesture of humanity as thus it rose to meet him bare and pure a strong descent leaped down a might a flame a beauty 
half visible with deathless eyes a violent ecstasy a sweetness dire enveloped him with its stupendous limbs and penetrated nerve and heart and brain that thrilled and fainted with the epiphany it's not easy to bear that tremendous descent um, you know it requires a tremendous purity inner strength great sincerity in a moment shorter than death longer than time by par more ruthless than love happier than heaven i am resisting the temptation of you know each of these lines are a marvel and a wonder taken sovereignly into eternal arms a bone into immeasurable heights it was torn out from its mortality and underwent a new and boneless change an omniscient knowing without sight or thought an indecipherable omnipotence so he suddenly experiences it's not just about the soul withdrawing in samadhi and then coming back into the fields of nature the nature itself is suddenly experiencing practical omniscience and practical omnipotence nature itself is being liberated from the clutch of mortality and death from the clutch of ignorance this is something which ashupati experiences and when he experiences this he could have gone ahead and uh, you know fulfilled himself but he suddenly a new aspiration wakes up in his heart and that aspiration is the key to the whole yoga and that aspiration is here to fulfill himself as god's desire he doesn't want it a lonely freedom cannot satisfy a heart that has grown one with every heart he was already uh, living in cosmic consciousness and now ashupati takes that great renunciation he renounces the individual realization and wants it for all now therein we see that the whole yoga takes a very different turn he wants it for all so he must know the all and how the divine has expressed himself in various ways so we have this wonderful book to traveler of the worlds where step by step ashwati climbs and sees how the divine energy has operated worked manifested how each of these layers planes because all this he has to survey he is now looking at the whole field of phenomena and all that is behind it because this field must change he's he's not looking for a door of escape anymore but to change the house so he looks at this many tired mansion of the lord and he goes step by step it's a wonderful journey a tremendous journey till he reaches the apex and as he reaches the apex he begins to see this new possibility from where this descent has leaped down and so he goes beyond the doors the last uh, heights that any human spiritual aspirant seeker realized yogi or siddh has ever reached the highest the over mind the doors of the sun which yagnaval uh, prays in 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 the isha upanishad hiranmaya na patrena satya syapitam mukam the face of truth is covered by a golden lid and he seeks he seeks to remove it Uh, you can't remove it it is only the grace which can remove it because no human power can remove the lid which the lord has put so this is the paradox so if that can be removed the law of truth can prevail upon earth right now we are under the law of death so he waits at the doors of the unknowable and then we have you know the great vision of from standing from that gate like a buddha the great vision of the param purush like some of these vedic rishis the unknowable in whom he could merge melt and dissolve but he doesn't want to do that because he has gone there with a deeper higher aspiration and just then we see in book 3 uh, canto 2 the divine mother comes and there is a beautiful uh, um, you know dialogue which takes place and ashupati she shows him the new creation she says i know why you have come you want to save the earth and mankind yes that is my original blueprint so first time we see in ash to ashupati's vision we see bear the original blueprint of god which is what the divine mother has planned but we are not ready so let me see we can quickly read take a little look at it so what is this new creation which um, has been prepared which is there as the original blueprint a living oneness widened at its core we are on page 322 and joined him to unnumbered multitudes is based on oneness it's based on unity and a unity based on truth not the mind's adjustment and accommodation and uh, placating with uh, falsehood uh, or you know uh, 
it's it's a unity which is spontaneous harmony which is uh, uh, very natural a bliss a light a power a flame white love caught all into a soul immense embrace existence found its truth on oneness breast this is the fundamental difference in the new creation and the old the old creation is based on division and the new creation is based on oneness but this oneness is not how the mind understand by joining everybody having a bon ami let's a party let's get together let's talk about unity it does because consciousness is divided <laughs> if consciousness is divided there will be divisions even when we talk about unity people will be divided over how to create this unity it won't be natural and spontaneous so it will break down so satvik ages of mankind have tried to create that kind of unity by the uh, you know um, um, by the peaks of a satvik nature human mind rational societies have tried to create it but they are going to fail it, it is not possible unless the consciousness changes so she shows uh, how beautiful it is all mind to feel was a flame discovery of god and each became the self and space of all all mind was a single harp of many strings all life a song of many meeting lives for worlds were many but the self was one then from the trance of that tremendous class went from the throbbings of that single heart and from the naked spirits victory in new and marvelous creation rose so ashpati has now glimpsed this new creation new creation in the sense the eternal new which has been originally intended and the divine mother then tells him i know you have come for this but earth is not ready man is not ready and she cautions him o son of strength to climbs creation speaks no soul is thy companion in the life people either want sustenance happy living comfort luxury or they want to escape from this uh, you know vanity of vanities but new creation upon earth no one really cares for that alone thou standest at the eternal doors but thou hast one is thine but ask no more so we know you know when she, when the mother came and shubhinda was asked what was her contribution to the yoga she says he says several things but one of the things that shubhinda says he says before the mother came i could help myself he could go ahead as far as possible into the supramental you know domains and uh, transformation of consciousness but he says i could not help others earth is not ready man is not ready so she says caution sashpati o voice arisen from the inconscient world how self thou speak for men whose hearts are dumb i am the goal of the travail of the sons i am the mystery beyond reach of mind i am the goal of the travail of the sons my fire and sweetness are the cause of life <coughs> but to immense my danger and my joy awake not the immeasurable descent man is too weak to bear the infinite's weight truth born too soon might break the imperfect earth so this is the problem there is the original plan and all this play of the gods and war with the titans and all the forces they have tried to prepare earth they reach a point but then it collapses and so there is pralaya so she says look many more ages are needed ultimately this is what is going to manifest and that's why shubhinda says the supramental creation is inevitable in the logic of things because divine is hidden in matter matter is destined to be divinized but it may take who knows lakh years during which who knows man will play with atoms and blow the world and many other means so who knows evolution has to proceed in in the sea through the dolphins we we don't know so uh, she says ki there is a long period don't call it now and then ashpati so beautifully says yes i know it is difficult but what could be impossible for the divine mother herself if you come down it is possible and that's a marvelous you know uh, passage o oh, truth defended in thy secret son o oh, wisdom splendor mother of the universe o oh, creatrix the eternals artist bride 
Linger not long with thy transmuting hand, pressed vainly on one golden bar of time. As if time dare not open its heart to God, O radiant fountain of the world's delight, world free and unattainable above, O bliss whoever dwellest deep hid within, while men seek the outside and never find. See, this um, divine mother is the creatrix. She's the one who has gone into the inconscient to build and she's the bridge. Unless the divine Shakti itself consents, it's not possible. So he say, he asks, he prays, he aspires that why don't you come down and take the human body and change things. Now, there is a period from 1920 to 1926. We'll see till 1920, Shubhendra written most of the things uh, about the future and how it, it may happen. And the mother has come. She has come for good. But she remains largely in a room or she would come time to time. She would give once in a while some meditation answer to someone, couple of questions, but largely she would be within herself. And once Amrita asked Shurabindo, he says that uh, she is a very great yogin. He says, yes, but she doesn't give meditations. <laughs> Shurabindo says, yes, but one day impelled by the divine love, she will come out. And that indeed will be a very great day. So for, a, for six years, we see that people are coming, uh, you know, they would stay sometimes, uh, in the same house for two days. Some of them were, had begun to stay for longer periods. There would be evening talks, but she did not accept anybody as disciple. Nothing official, no ashram, nothing. In fact, he would rather say no, because what he wants to do, it is possible only if the Divine Mother consents. And then we see that 26, the great change takes place. That's a whole story. And the Divine Mother consents. And after that, we see that disciples come, the house of the, um, uh, you know, the Lord is what we call as the ashram, you know, officially, if you may say so, was born and a new effort starts. So the Divine Mother consents here and she says, okay, I will come down. I will take up this work. A seed shall be sown in death's tremendous hour, a branch of heaven transplant to human soil. Nature shall overleap. A mortal step, fate shall be changed by an unchanging will. So that's what we see that fate, you know, she is the one who takes a human body and takes the challenge of fate. Now, this is where Ashupati's work is done. And we see in, uh, again and again, I'm putting it in context with Shurabindu's life. The mother is placed in the forefront, Shurabindu steps behind. What he is doing is a different side of the story. But now the mother takes charge of the yoga. She is the one who has to show the uh, what really man has to do to participate in this yoga. That's why when we look at, you know, Shobindu's writings, most of Shobindu's writings talk about the principle of the yoga. There are practices, but not elaborately. In letters on yoga, we find some practices. But when we read the mother's writing, it is she who has been given the charge of the yoga. And, the, and Shobindu says very clearly that, you know, it is through the mother that you have to go. So it is in the mother's yoga. Now, of course, in Savitri, we see the mother going, growing up, Savitri growing up, and then she meets Satyavan. So who is Satyavan? Suddenly, who is introduced in the character is us. So Savitri is our story, but the story, our story, which is running from times immemorial. We too are a uh, you know, miniature portion of the Lord, but we don't know. We are caught up in the net of ignorance, in the forest of ignorance. And Savitri and Satyavan meet, come together, and then a new journey begins. And there is a beautiful description of who Satyavan is. Satyavan is not, uh, you know, a highly intellectual pandit, but he is the person who intuitively has that experience of the divine. So he speaks about, Shubhendu describes him as a Veda knower of the unwritten book. And he is seeking for a link between earth and the divine. So that is the kind of humanity which is ideal. Not humanity which is seeking some experience or through a door of escape. Neither a humanity which is completely indulging in, uh, you know, uh, whatever this outer world has to offer. Uh, all is too little that the world can give, as Shubhendu says. But somebody who knows this world, knows that there is something called a beyond, has some kind of an intuitive glimpse, but doesn't have the clue to join it. 
doesn't know uh, you know but yet it he has a aspiration for terrestrial perfection so such a humanity may be far off yes is chosen and picked up so we see here satyavan comes in and a new dimension is added to the yoga but first savitri undertakes the yoga for man and so if we want to know uh, what really we have to do uh, just as in you know shubhendra's writings it's if you want to know what we have to do we have to turn to the mother and we see in the mother's writing we see in the mother's uh, you know uh, journey in the mother's countless volumes prayers and meditations how exactly we have to approach and uh, we see here in yoga of savitri yoga of the divine mother this truth is being revealed to us on page 488 i am not touching upon the context and the background of course is the challenge of fate and the challenge of death so savitri has to show to man that when we are challenged by fate when there are challenging times when we are challenged by nothing else but death itself um, how are we to deal with that you know that's how we had begun that today we said speak of challenging times what is required what is required is not outer manipulations there are people instrument who will do it but for the handful who are ready who are seekers what is required is to create that breakthrough but a breakthrough within not a breakthrough outside breakthrough outside follows once there is a breakthrough within and savitri shows us the way she is told for man thou seekest not for thyself alone so we see the yoga of savitri is described in elaborate detail so though, though it is the yoga that the divine mother undertakes it is here that we find the entire path as uh, the mother writes in savitri we find the entire path for those who seek for the yoga of transformation so we see here the whole path in great detail only if god assumes the human mind we see her avataric role the avatar takes a human cloth and shows us the way and puts on mortal ignorance for his cloak and makes himself the dwarf with triple stride this dwarf with triple stride is not the puranic uh, vamana but the vedic uh, dwarf uh, who you know with the three strides measures the earth and the heavens and of course the beyond which is yet to come can he help man to grow into the god so the original plan is for man to grow into the uh, divine so hamasmi is not just an deep inner truth it is but it must become a truth of matter it must become a truth of the mind truth of the heart such should be our uh, great identity with the divine man human follows in god's human steps so very clearly it is shown to us if we want to know what we have to do from the savitri's perspective then we see here um, the entire yoga is revealed and uh, this yoga is given in very few words interesting program that is given to savitri it's a whole program given which is there on page 476 in 18 lines we have the entire yoga given to man of course the practice is we'll come to that as we uh, go through savitri the program is this and i feel i have often said this this is a passage we should put in our heart first and then on our cupboard shelf everywhere because this is what we are supposed to do um, the voice reply because savitri is receiving her program remember why thou camest again the soul passage is a workshop remember why thou camest find out thy soul recover thy hid self unless we find the psychic being we'll only talk about the super mind and transformation and everything else first step to remember why we are here to know the goal the aspiration find the soul recover thy hid self in silence seek god's meaning in thy depths the purpose for which we are here then mortal nature change to the divine we are, we are here to change this mortal nature into divine not just to discover a divine portion within us it was anyways there <laughs> whether we discovered or not that paras mani that uh, you know that uh, touch stone that alchemy stone is there inside us so what's the big deal about discovering it if it cannot be brought in the forefront to transmute earthly life so what are we supposed to do open god's door enter into his trance cast 
thought from thee, that nimble leap of light. We cannot know it, uh, you know, beautifully in Savitri elsewhere. We have these lines that um, heaven is too high for outstretched hands to seize. In the mind's silence, the transcendent acts, and the hushed heart hears the unuttered word. So we have to seek. Uh, we have to cast thought and seek light in his tremendous hush stilling thy brain. How to quieten the mind? How to silence the mind? By contact with the divine. That is the secret revealed to us. His vast truth wake within and know and see. Cast from these sense that weighs thy spirit sight. This is happening. That is happening in all events and circumstances. To see the play of the divine and how that play is unfolding. That's all should be our aspiration. In the enormous emptiness of thy mind, thou shalt see the eternal's body in the world. Know him in every voice heard by thy soul. If you read through Shabindo's all the talks and you know letters on yoga, this is the first practice. Uh, equanimity, not only of in terms of being, uh, you know, not affected by outer circumstances, but equanimity to see the divine in all events, circumstances, situations, people. And how he is unfolding himself and working that great divine intent. In the world's contacts, meet his single touch. This is Shobindo's experience in the Alipur jail. All things shall fold thee into his embrace. Conquer thy heart's throbs. Let thy heart beat in God. How beautiful. All these emotional ups and downs and upheavals and churnings. Let emotions give themselves to the divine. Thy nature shall be the engine of his works. Thy voice shall house the mightiness of his word. Then shall thou harbor my force and conquer death. So this is the program that Savitri undertakes and we know it's a long, beautiful journey where the entire passages describe the challenges, the difficulties, where we could stop unwittingly, where could be trapped the intermediate zone of the vital, mistake it for the uh, luminous, the higher worlds, where we could stop the uh, ins of the mind, uh, just um, uh, a kind of faith which the mind holds, belief systems, how they can uh, trap us. And then how we have to pursue our journey deeper and deeper into the soul. And then we discover the three Madonas, the three great, the origin of the triple soul. Because we knew neither Prakriti nor Purusha, if I may say so. But if you touch the soul, you discover there these purest forms of energy are entering or emerging from there. And we can enter to the soul, swimming through any of these currents. Of course, the best current, the highest current is Sattva, but we have to go right to the origin. So Savitri goes there, discovers the soul, and then we have a description of how all the celestial centers open. And from this celestial center, new possibilities. Um, I'm just resisting the temptation to read all that. And then she enters into that state where there is a complete annulment of the ego. And the mother repeatedly speaks about it. You can't have the new creation and the ego intact. Ego has to be annulled. Now, many people catch it from the wrong end and, you know, they start becoming a martyr to everybody else because <laughs> they think I must get rid of the ego. No, we have to get rid of the ego only at the one true altar that is the divine. Uh, she is not advising us to become a football. Whom anybody can kick because we are becoming egoless. <laughs> we won't become egoless. We'll develop a very strong tamasic ego. Let's see how much I am sacrificing. Look at me. I am such a martyr. No, the divine doesn't want that. So we have to sacrifice the ego at the only altar, which is the divine. And then she gets that annul thyself that only God can be. Beautiful description. There we also see a very interesting passage. You know, the after realizing nirvana, there is a whole section in Essays on the Gita where Shubindu elaborates. And this is important because it challenges the traditional notions that can one engage in works in a state of nirvana. And very clearly, Sri Krishna says yes, and Shubindu says yes. And here he describes that Savitri, after attaining nirvana, and it's not that one will always then sit quietly, not do 
engage in you know the normal ordinary activities because one has become a guru none of those things here savitri was arrived at nirvana that state is described um this is on page um, 551 for those who may like to read now later so what they see to all she was the same perfect savitri they saw a person where was only god's vast a still being or a mighty nothingness a greatness and a sweetness and a light poured out from her upon her little world life showed to all the same familiar face her acts followed the old unaltered round it doesn't mean that a yogi has to suddenly start doing different things he may continue to to do the very same things unless impelled by the divine will he is moved towards some other field his very presence is uh, an action of pouring of divine forces she spoke the words that she was wont to speak and did the things that she had always done so we have a very amazing experience of you know savitri in a state of nirvana continuing and then the divine will expresses itself in her through makes her one with all being so we have that cosmic consciousness she identifies with the rose with the star with the life of plant bird beast man titans gods everything in the universe because she sees in the void the omniscient supreme so this is where we see and this is the path which is carved out for man and now comes the third part of the journey the third part of the yoga where savitri and satyavan must go together so there is of course the happy part of the journey where savitri and satyavan i often you know see this Uh, as the first step of yoga when the psychic being emerges and everything is so wonderful everybody looks saintly the dining room food is uh, heavenly paradise and everybody in the ashram is nothing less than the <laughs> god and so on and so forth i don't want to elaborate and the mother has spoken about it there used to be a pamphlet which used to be given earlier to those who come to the ashram and advice to newcomers it's worth reading it's on page 47 now volume 12 and advice to newcomers and she would say when people come they come with psychic being in front and everything is wonderful but then the moment the yoga enters into the fields of nature which is a field of death asana mrityu that's where the fight begins and we see that that whole thing in the book of death that satyavan must die why he must die literally it means many things but to say the least he has to enter into the fields of death and but because he is connected now with the divine mother she comes with her, with him so that is a beauty uh, ordinary also one goes through the fields of death here death is unconsciousness falsehood and all these things are in this single term death uh, but <coughs> when one is connected to the divine mother by an opening of the soul by faith by aspiration then the divine mother enters and fights and wins the victory of the sadhak so this is the victory of the divine mother in each one so as we see satyavan is taken by death the divine mother goes there and she fights the great battle against death so death has hold on various aspects of our being body is the last or the strongest first rather because matter is emerged from the inconscient but it has a hold on our mind so our mind refuses this possibility it is a hold on the heart it ignorantly loves our life which runs after transient boon so all this is revealed in savitri it's a wonderful <coughs> book but uh, what i need to I, i want to read is that death opposes at every point um, death is a great denial of a divine manifestation upon earth so it says at most you can go away into some high heaven first it denies there is anything like divine then at savitri this is okay okay i okay there is somebody someone something out there impersonal hush it has nothing to do with this world jagat mithya brahma sat you go there i have no issues don't call back satyavan <laughs> this is against the law and savitri says i have come to <laughs> change the law so this is where we see the difference between the traditional yoga where we go beyond the law so beyond the law is somebody who is caught on the traffic and he says do you know who is Uh, well in india it works i don't know uh, <laughs> is it do you know i am son in law or i am nephew of the minister 
Oh, oh, sir, please go. Now, what has happened? He has escaped the law, but the law is unchanged. But here, imagine a prime minister in disguise walks on the road, like old time kings, and suddenly people catch him, and he says, "Oh, this is the law. This must change." So, this is the difference between saint and an avatar. Saint shows the path of escaping from the law. Few, and that's what Shri Bindu says: escape, however high, redeems not life. Even if a few escape. The rest linger on, but saints don't care. It's it's okay. If you have escaped, the rest I, we are not concerned about the metaphysics of the whole thing. But there are souls, the heroic souls that the mother says, who want this to change here. So they enter the law, and the divine comes along with them because this is the promise of the divine, and he has himself gone under the yoke of the law, and it would explain many things about the mother and Shivendra's life which we don't understand today. Why they have to. Suffer apparently like a human being, because then only he can show us the remedy. A doctor who has never fallen sick, never go to such a doctor, and never fight under the banner of a leader who has never failed. Shubhendra says that a leader who has never failed cannot guide you. That's why you know I often quote this story of endurance by Shackleton, which is you know a marvelous Arctic adventure where the adventure failed, but Shackleton is regarded as really a great greatest. Uh, leader of all times because he steered everybody through it. So uh, the divine himself goes through all this, and then the human, when he enters, the divine mother comes with us and fights. So death gives all kinds of logic, and uh, Savitri um, reveals that look, if you look at this earth, what is happening is nothing else but a progressive evolution, which is a manifestation. And she gives the example of love. Beautiful. A mystic slow transfiguration works. All over Earth starts from mud and ends in sky and love that was once an animal's desire. Then a sweet madness in the rapturous heart, an ardent comradeship in the happy mind, becomes a wide spiritual yearning space. A lonely soul passions for the alone, the heart that loved man. Thrills to the love of God, and this not the end. Then all is discovered in God. This love extends itself to all human beings, to all creation. So why he uses the example of love? Because love is the power of transformation. And first thing is to rescue this power out of the clutch of ignorance. Because if this is rescued, the rest follow. So first thing, repeatedly we see death tells Savitri that you know you are too much. You talk about love. You must know. If you know, you will cease to love. And Savitri replies, "When I have loved all, then I will know. For love is a vast, immense embrace. So this power must be rescued, and that's why she will insist on the psychic change, insist on turn to the mother, insist on devotion, devotion, faith, surrender, particularly surrender, because this is the real key. We may have illuminations in the mind, but if the inner being." The inmost being is not ready to become a child newborn to the mother. This yoga cannot be done. Show me those words. So one may have amazing experiences in the illuminations in the mind, uh, siddhis in the vital, even feats in the physical, and yet nothing has been done if we do not become a child newborn to the divine mother. So, anyways, death continues. He is a very obstinate fellow. Uh, he is not the doubting Thomas, but hundred times more. and then savitri counter so through all these counter she is removing from the human mind the cobwebs uh, because we are moving from the rational to the intuitive age so all these are not death seems to become a very rational guy because he is using every uh, weapon at his hand to thwart this possibility so i am not going to read death's argument but it is important to read them because when these thoughts come we will know that they are manufactured by messrs death and company And straight away reject them, and that fellow is very cunning and deceptive. He will make us feel, "Oh, these are my thoughts. This is the opinion of others." Well, he has a big network. Need not talk about uh, him. Uh, mother uses the word; he is a joker, and yes, but a joker who has, you know, seems to have come everywhere. And mankind, the amount of belief, all that I would say is the amount of belief we have put in death and its reality. if we put a fraction of it in the divine and his reality life would be very different but we somehow seem to believe that is the only reality if only, if only or even if there is divine he has no hold over it so we have you know savitri reveals to him 
648, she says, if in the meaningless void creation rose, if from a bodiless force matter was born, if life could climb in the unconscious tree, its green delight break into emerald leaves, and its laughter of beauty blossom in the flower, if sense could wake in tissue, nerve and cell, and thought sees the gray matter of the brain, and soul peep from its secrecy through the flesh. All these are preparatory steps nature has already undertaken. How shall the nameless light not leap on men and unknown powers emerge from nature's sleep? Even now the deathless lover's touch we feel. If the chamber's door is even a little ajar, what then can hinder God from stealing in? Or who forbid his kiss on the sleeping soul? So ultimately, death, of course, says that all that is fine, you convince me, but I am not to be convinced only by reason. Show me the power. See, power is something which, that is one of the challenges of today, that we have science which through its power has created things. Whereas yogi simply teach meditation and remain quiet. Now, it's okay, but you know, where is that power which can be tangible, visible in the mind of man, in the heart? Of course, we are not talking about power as crude, vulgar power to show miracles. But where is that miracle where a mind is transmuted into a mind of light? That miracle where a heart which harbors bitterness suddenly becomes a, you know, a vessel of sacred joy, of sweetness and love of the divine. Where is that life which can draw its breath from the luminous springs, luminous force of the divine? And where is that body which can open to the divine force and heal? So this is the power which man has to embody. And so death says, show me the power. And Savitri reveals the incarnation, thrust aside her veil, and death dies. It's a beautiful passage. And when death dies, she is face to face with now falsehood, distortions, they have gone. So she stands naked with truth and bliss and light and consciousness. That which had worn the mask of death. In, in uh, mythology, Yama is the child of Surya. So Surya is the original. Yama is the fellow who is... Of course, there are Rigvedic legions also, but I'm not getting into that. But, you know, Yama is the subordinate. He is like a manager. People are not ready. Teach them, make them ready. But the law of truth is the original truth. So now she stands face to face and says, well, earth must change. And again, the same challenge. Sun says, are you sure earth is ready? They can't bear. If temperature goes a little high, then man begins to become restless. Already there is enough global warming. You want me to come? <laughs> and Savitri, uh, ultimately, it's a wonderful passage. And again, paucity of time. One small little thing, page 689, we often say, where is the supermind? Where is the transformation? We don't realize now we have to play our role. They have done everything and still are doing, but they have stepped a little behind the veil so that we can become ready. And now the Supreme tells Savitri, heaven's call is rare, rarer the heart that heeds. The doors of light are sealed to common mind and earth's needs nail to earth the human mass. Only in an uplifting hour of stress, men answer to the touch of greater things. Or raised by the, some strong hand to breathe heaven air, they slide back to the mud from which they climbed. People sit at Samadhi in the ashram for some time, feel very good after coming out. They ask the same question. How is your son doing? Has he finally got the visa to US? No. Oh, look at it. Now, this is how human nature is. That's why a one-pointed aspiration. They joy in safe return to a friendly base and though something in them weeps for glory lost and greatness murdered, they accept their fall to be the common man, they think the best. To live as others live is their delight. Anyways, Savitri ultimately, she is the avatar. She convinces him. She says, no, I refuse thy lures. You have been luring everybody with this otherworldly trick. I refuse it. I want that here, that mystery to reveal itself, to manifest itself. And she is given a choice on behalf of mankind. She chooses. Uh, again, we cannot read all that, but page 696, 697, 
uh, my one of my very favorite powerful passages where Savitri makes the choice. I'll just read the four choices she makes for man. These are the boons we receive in the original story. The matter ends with Satyavan coming back. But here she wants for the entire mankind. Thy peace, O Lord, a boon within to keep amid the roar and ruin of wild time for the magnificent soul of man on earth. Thy calm, O Lord, that bears thy hands of joy. Now, in life, she wants all these things to manifest. Not when we sit in meditation, not when we... That's why all these special processes, special methods, they are not the key. The key is to manifest the divine by a constant state of inner communion. Thy oneness, Lord, in many approaching hearts, my sweet infinity of thy numberless souls, thy energy, Lord, to seize on women and men, to take all things and creatures in their grief, and gather them into a mother's arms. And finally she asks, Thy embrace which rends the living knot of pain. Not through death, the living knot of pain, which is a knot of ignorance. Thy embrace which rends the living knot of pain. Thy joy, O Lord, in which all creatures breathe. Thy magic flowing waters of deep love. Thy sweetness give to me for earth and men. So, what follows is the future. So, this he has done and there are those who have this aspiration are called upon. They have to undertake this journey. But the promise is ultimately not just for those who are undertaking the journey, but all whose lives will be tested, not for the entire earth and mankind, but those who have some kind of a faith, some kind of an opening. So the boon follows, and that is the boon which is being realized, which is on the way towards its realization, a, a, a stupendous result of all our spiritual strivings, which up till now was either a freedom from ignorance, that means we discover the soul, we discover that there is something beyond the mind, or it was to ultimately enter into a state of nirvana where we enter into the stillness of the divine, into the sheer peace, and I won't use the word quietude because quietude becomes a very, um, still something which is, uh, you know, <laughs> moving, but in the state of perfect immobility of the Buddha, one enters within, but the out nature and we can enter into it through so many paths. The best is of course the yoga or the Gita. But outer nature the body, the instruments our nature, mind heart, life, body the, the threefold forces the three gunas, they remain unchanged. So we are inwardly free but outwardly we are what we are. I wouldn't use the word bound because there is nobody there to be bound. It's just the movement of nature and the yogin continues to remain there as long as he wishes, exhausting past karmas or whatever and then eventually he withdraws. Unless like Buddha he stays on the threshold or Sri Ramakrishna and continues to help mankind. But by and large, ultimately he will inevitably withdraw after showing to others the door of escape. But here, the very life in its principle must change. The very body must change. That means that we no more have to undertake these kind of practices and yoga. Just like man's human child by birth can acquire thought. A chimpanzee cannot. So a time will come, is fast coming and those who are aware can actually see it happening where children will begin to embody more and more this higher consciousness. And this passage was also there. We did read it in the vision and the boon. So these kind of children who will come with a higher consciousness and they will begin to change the earth because they will look at things very differently. They will embody a new consciousness. They don't have to undertake the classical yoga, but very soon they will pick it up. And this is going to happen because of the supramental manifestation and which has begun, begun since 29th February, 1956. So boon has been given, but now we see what are going to be the far-reaching results of this manifestation which has already begun. 
what will happen to <coughs> individuals the mind shall be god visions tabernacle this is page 707 the body intuitions instrument and life a channel for god's subtle power all earth shall be the spirit's manifest home and it continues uh, man shall forget consent to mortality and it's full proof even if there is a hostile force that clings <coughs> ultimately the supramental will the divine will will prevail the superman will be born and even the multitude shall hear the voice and make an answer and this goes on till page 710 where finally the collective emancipation the collective realization or manifestation that is revealed to us more and more souls shall enter into light minds lit inspired the occult summoner here and lives blaze with a sudden inner flame and hearts grow enamored of divine delight this is future is prophesied in uh, book 1 canto 4 also the secret knowledge but here it's shown with some detail and human wills tune to the divine will these separate selves the spirits oneness feel these senses of heavenly sense grow capable this is a transmutation through and through right up to the senses and the body the flesh and nerves of strange of a strange ethereal joy and mortal bodies of immortality so it's not just the immortality within of the soul not even the immortality of the cosmic consciousness but the immortality even in the very body the cells will taste the nectar of the gods a divine force shall flow through tissue and cell and take the charge of breath and speech and act and all the thoughts shall be a glow of suns and every feeling a celestial thrill and at the end thus shall the earth open to divinity and common natures feel the wide uplift illumine common acts with the spirit's ray and meet the deity in common things more and more people join there will be a tipping point suddenly it will spread like a wildfire the tipping point is what is needed maybe it has already come we don't know the spirit shall take up the human play this earthly life become the life divine so this is uh, the future and uh, just to close it satyavan gives a wise advice after going through so you know here in ashram initially the old time sadhaks when people ask them something about yoga they were never going to give a big lecture or going to say okay i'll teach you meditation no they have learned the secret and they would often say take mother's name i have heard this from people and i used to wonder take mother's name that will do all work the wonder <laughs> and now i realize after all this years oh my god that is a real thing of course i am not saying just take mother's name mechanically don't do anything you're not talking of all that that is a but look at what satyavan has to say who has gone through the clutch of death and come out so and what this realization will be is further described on page 719 all now is changed yet all is still the same lo we have looked upon the face of god our life has opened with divinity we have born identity with the supreme and known his meaning in our mortal lives our love has grown greater by that mighty touch that is the beauty of this realization it doesn't ask to become a ascetic or now to you know just be shut in the doors behind the ramparts of an ashram or to join a group and be safe there that is a beginning when the plant is small but eventually this percolates in every sphere of life our love has grown greater by that mighty touch and learned its heavenly significance yet nothing is lost of mortal love's delight mark the words heavens touch fulfills but cancels not our earth and as if so that we don't once again lose in jargon he adds our bodies need each other in the same last this body being driven by the divine shakti become a instrument the vehicle a vessel 
of the divine force. This is the destiny of the body, which has not even been dreamed. Maybe there are some odd hints in here and there in some legends. But frankly, we understand the hints only after reading Shurabindu and the mother. <laughs> Otherwise, they just pass off like stories of Gilgamesh. <clears throat> so she says, nothing has changed. I am your counterpart. And uh, our wedded walk through life begins anew. So what will these transformed beings do? They are already transformed. So there she gives a hint. Now grief is dead and serene bliss remains. Let us go back for Eve is in the skies. The heart of all our days forevermore. So grief is dead and bliss remains forever. Lo, all these beings in this wonderful world. Let us give joy to all for joy is ours. For not for ourselves alone, our spirits came. So she says, what is the work after that? To become a divine center for the transformation of humanity. To lead man's soul towards truth and God we are born. To draw the checkered scheme of mortal life into some semblance of the immortal's plan. To shape it closer to an image of God a little nearer to the idea of divine. Then this becomes the occupation or the preoccupation in whatever field one is doing. Medicine, engineering, in human relationship, in life, in everyday act. That must be tuned to the rhythm of the divine, to the will of the divine, to the force of the divine, through the love of the divine. As mother put it, to live for the divine, to love the divine, to work for the divine, to become the divine in everything. So, this is the great change and uh, toward the end, as I said, when everybody asks, what has happened to her? And Satyavan gives us the secret, as all do, who have gone at least some way through the journey. Page 723. Lay all on her. She is the cause of all. Original cause of creation is the divine Shakti. It is only the original cause which understands everything in creation. And she alone can transform it if we surrender ourselves, lay everything in our hands, whether through remembering and offering, through faith, through devotion, through aspiration. It is she who can transmute it. Lay all on her. She is the cause of all. And then Someone remarks, if this is she, if this is she of whom the world has heard, wonder no more at any happy change, each easy miracle of felicity of her transmuting heart, the alchemy is. So this is, uh, sorry I had to rush through. I was uh, very hesitant in one hour whether we can touch something, but I think something has been touched. And this, the real story of a life. And as we tune in to the divine, as we turn to the mother, she stands at the gate of the supramental transformation. We cannot do it by our effort. We cannot do it by all kinds of, you know, uh, now many mothers have come up. So we cannot do it by them because, you know, the mandate is, if this is she of whom the world has heard. So she alone, because she has given that charge. She has taken that charge by first taking a human body, human cloak, and then by crossing all the layers and then seeking the boon from the divine, just by saying that X is mother and Y is mother. Uh, that's only to distract us, amuse us maybe, and deviate from the path. But to turn to the mother, as Shubindu said in very simple words, open to the mother. If you find her, all else is achieved. The mother is the path and the mother is the goal. Lay all on her. She is the cause of all. Namaste. Mm. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alok, for this beautiful um, overview of the most uh, profound uh, poetry in the world and vision of Sri Aurobindo and the mother. 
And there are several two questions here for you. One is, how does one know if one has the call or if the mind is trying to an escape from the current state of life, believing that one is being called. Okay, how does one know, know that there is the call? Well, call is call. As far as the mind's deception, mind usually gives some logic unless somebody has heard the call directly and knows that this is the thing to be done. Call means this is what is now my life, this is my aim, regardless of everything else. Doesn't mean that one leaves the work and rushes to the ashram. It doesn't mean that, you know, challenges of life don't, <laughs> don't come in between. But this much one knows that this is the thing to be done and this is what I am here to do. This is evident. Now the mind sometimes can start playing a trick in two ways. One is sometimes the divine knowing the mind is not ready may put this way that look here, if you take this path, you will be more comfortable. <laughs> life will be easy. It's okay. It doesn't matter. Call still stand. That is the beauty. Or the mind can play a, another trick. Maybe my call is simply a mental thing. So <laughs> it doesn't matter. <laughs> Don't analyze the call. If there is this urge inside that this is to be done, then this is to be done. That's finished. Whatever the mind may say, it will say 100 things. It will try to even say, well, you may have had the call, but you are not fit for the path to all such things which may come, when, especially when one enters into the territories of nature, the voice of night, the voice of death, to all such voices, one has to reply, I'm a child of light, I'm a child of immortality, and I'm a child of the Divine Mother. She has called me, and I cannot fail. So this is the whole journey. Mm, thank you very much. It's a there deep is... inner conviction that one is born to do it. It's not a mentally mm. rationalized thought. Right. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Pandey. Truly thought-provoking talk with deep insight and many ideas. I wanted to know what exactly did Sri Aurobindo mean by the double twilight? Okay, so there are, this is on the book of death, we have these two twilight. One is the twilight of the heavenly ideal. So basically, Savitri is moved by the ideal of this earth becoming beautiful. Now, this is not a new ideal. Time to time, human beings have conjured this. Ram Rajya or the you know universal brotherhood. In several ways, human beings have uh, been driven by this great ideal which has seized them in a certain moment of time. So, heavenly the twilight of the heavenly ideal is uh, when uh, it's the morning time, you know, we have two twilights. So, the images of the morning time, when the gods are entering into creation, so these gods inspire us towards great heights. So death says, okay, I understand that time there is a gleam, but death, uh, you know, says, I know these gods are corrupting your mind, but wait and watch. Now this twilight of the morning gods, it, you know, doesn't last. So later on, the other twilight is, this has to be tested on the earthly real, whether it will stand the test of earth. That is the whole challenge of death. Human beings, you know, prophets and, uh, heroes and martyrs who have gone the way, who have aspired that this earth becomes beautiful. It is echoed in their words, echoed sometimes in their action. Take the French Revolution, which Shovindo speaks about. So many uh, take the Egyptian queens, you know, charter on, uh, or will take the conception of Ram Raj way back in India. So there has always been time to time these ideals, but death says, are you sure it will be established? So that is the earthly real. So what is the earthly real? The, the second twilight? As this morning twilight sinks towards evening, it vanishes into night. That is the pralaya. So that's where the real drama has to take place. And that's why the death ends there. Death is killed in its own den. Savitri takes it right up to there. And he says, where do I see on earth uh, the divine manifestation? All these thoughts are beautiful. There are gleamings in your mind. There is a malady of the mind. There are hallucinations. All these challenges. Death poses to Savitri, she replies. And finally, he says, but where on earth? I don't see anything happening on earth. Then that passage which I read, if in the void creation rose, the transmutation of love, she gives various examples. And finally, it is in that home of death because matter is the stronghold of the inconscient. So it says, Ki, okay, I understand. Now I'm sort of convinced maybe you are logical, but do we have the power to change matter? And that's where she reveals the power and death rushes out from the its grip upon matter into the inconscient. It, it vanishes into the inconscient 
uh, those who want to remain in this grip continue to remain. That's a different story altogether. So this is the second twilight. Second twilight is where all these beautiful ideals that uh, time to time take shape in human consciousness eventually dip and end in the night. So the second twilight is the one where the real challenge, as they say, that the test is uh, in practical life. It's all very good, uh, you know, airy fairy. <laughs> so in real life, and that's where the twilight of the earthly real comes in. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. There is one more question. How to apply savagery to mental illness and addicts and depressed? This is a big question. How to apply savagery to mental illness? Well, I'm a doctor. All that I would say is that ultimately all solution of illnesses of various kinds, including mental illnesses, that man must uh, you know, leave the ways of falsehood, of vanity, of crookedness, of insincerity, and take to the straight path of the divine. So ultimately, how does it apply? Open to the divine, open to the grace. Now, obviously, when one is in the grip of these forces, you know, of illness, it's not easy, especially when the mind itself, because ordinarily, the mind helps you to open when the body is ill. But if the mind itself is seized, it becomes more difficult to separate from the mind and do it. So that's why it's okay if one is taking some medication or whatever, because you know one needs to take a vantage point. But at the same time, the permanent remedy will not be with medication, but in the shift of consciousness. That shift comes by turning to the divine, by whatever means, through faith, through aspiration, it persists. And I can say this on the basis of my long, long, long experience, but please don't, con I mean, I, I, you can't treat people on phone or otherwise, but it's a fact I have seen, I have seen people who had opened to the mother with long standing chronic schizophrenic illnesses, needing much lower medicine and having those periods where the force would come, these hostile forces, and they would know that this is something which I should not concede to. And I have seen people who required much lesser doses and the illness could have taken much worse form, which also I have seen in those who are not open, not willing to take that route and this. So definitely to turn to the divine, to open to the divine, we come back to that famous line, lay all on her, she is the cause of all. So offer everything to her, including the illness, including the movement, but with an aspiration and a will for sincerity. And Savitri is about all this aspiration. It shows that how in the vital world, man can be caught. There are people whom I met, they believe that they are God. They believe they are incarnation of the mother. That's why I was mentioning. They believe that they are the ones through whom now Sri Aurobindo is speaking. Well, Sri Aurobindo can speak through anyone, including a child. That's a different story altogether. But ego aggrandizement in the vital world. Now, all these are facts. It's not recognized as a mental illness. But it's much worse because you are distracting many people away. So, you know, all this is described in Savitri, especially when we read about the intermediate zone, the valley of the false glimmer where death walks wearing the face of deathless life. And truth does the works of falsehood with bandaged arms. You know, all that is described. So we, and then when we go through those uh, cantos, book two, canto seven and eight, descent into night, we will see what are the forms of falsehood, how it takes the human mind captive in its net. So when we begin to become aware and a discernment awakes in us, we can show the net. It may not be difficult uh, if one is strongly in grip, but we can see that this is not the right kind of thought, this doubt, this pushing me over the edge. This is not true. What is true is the divine, the one, the, the mother, the grace, the divine love. So these are many things which are there as part of Savitri and uh, there is something for everyone. Thank you. There is one more question, the last one. What can I do every day to get closer to the psychic in me? What can I do every day to get closer to the psychic in me? Uh, morning when we wake up, think of the Divine Mother, offer the day to the Divine Mother. When we go for bath, offer to the Divine Mother. When we read something, when we speak, when we do something, when we go to the office, drive the car, scooter, meet people, start with offering to the Divine Mother. When the thing ends, close it by gratitude to the Divine Mother. In between, remember and keep offering to the Divine Mother. So the more we invoke the Divine Mother, the psychic will come. Poor fellow is looking for his mother. <laughs> After all, what is psychic? Psychic is the baby. So the moment, you know, but 
uh, it will automatically come it wants that food it wants that nourishment we have it is malnourished we have overnourished our bellies and mind but poor psyche so to think of the divine mother is the straight road but along with that we can take out uh, moments when we sit and concentrate in the heart uh, we draw all the strings of consciousness that are spread out that means practice of detachment nishkam karma equanimity three fundamental practices which help us to concentrate because otherwise the consciousness keeps roaming in those realms the mind even when we shut the eyes uh, in fact for most people opening the eyes is better because at least you can focus on something if you close the eyes the thoughts come in so detachment equanimity and uh, nishkam karma are three fundamental practices which help us to be freed from the clutch of the senses then of course awakening of discernment if we take that way there is a whole yoga but refer everything to the mother the key mantra is remember and offer anything and everything including when we are taking a bathroom when we are in the bathroom even a having getting leavings gifts come gifts go everything connect with the divine mother in all our relationship the man i am in love with is the divine mother is in him he is not meant to be just to satisfy me the woman whom i love the divine mother is in her and she is not meant to just uh, you know look after me and uh, just give whatever people uh, i don't know what they desire and want but in every relationship everywhere to have this constant vision of the divine mother who is inside uh, it's a journey but um, well that's the beauty of the journey that initially it is difficult but as it grows it becomes easy and easy in ordinary life life is easy in the big thing i don't know what it means but apparently it tastes very sweet but over a period of time the sweetness turns into diabetes in the beginning life is difficult in yoga because you have to discipline you have to concentrate you have to remember and offer you have to get rid of nishkam karma oh my god it doesn't mean we will not charge a fee fee is coming it's okay but one is not working to have a fee one is working to express the divine what comes we receive as gift of grace what goes goes to the divine mother so if we live life like that it becomes beautiful and after a while we are on the royal grand trunk road as it is called in india <laughs> royal road to highways to the divine uh, bliss <laughs> yeah okay so thank you very much for this beautiful exposition we are looking forward again to meet with you in two weeks and again on savitri it would be great to continue thank you namaste thank you namaste thank you dr pandey thank you namaste